Hello, welcome back to my channel, Perpetual Outsider. My name is John, you're in my kitchen of retro, and today we are going to be looking at the second instalment of An Unearthly Child, which was first broadcast on the 30th of November 1963, shortly after uh, a repeat of the first episode. This one is called The Cave of Skulls. Back in those days, they didn't actually say episode one or episode two or part one or part two, whatever. Um, so without further ado, enough yakking from me. Let's get right to it. Here we go. Cave of Skulls. Yeah. Yeah, these these titles are great, you know, very, uh, again, very ahead of our time. Yeah, Bernard Lo Bernard Lodge was a genius. I mean, he he really really did it so well because a lot of the time in the you know the sixties and seventies it it would just be you know a simple a simple caption over a blank screen or something, um, and in you know when the seventies went on it was you know maybe a um, a series of clips in you know, interspersed with the logo, the Cave of Skulls. And there is Czar, played by Jeremy Young. And he just kind of looks, what the hell? And here we go into the Tribe of Gum, which was also the um, an alternative title for this. I'm not really quite sure um, where all that came from. Uh, that kid just he looks really bored. <laughs> He's, he's like, oh, it's a bloke rubbing two sticks together, you know, to try and make fire. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to bugger off now. So here we've got, yeah, the tribe gum. That is Derek Newark, who would return in Inferno. So the chances of Czar, is it Czar or is it Cow? I always get them confused between two. I, th I think it's Czar. Um and of course, Derek knew it would, would return in Inferno. So that means that Zar could well be the great, 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 great grandfather of uh, Greg Sutton. Could be. Who knows? Completely different character. And um, with him is Alethea Charlson. I think that's how you pronounce it. And she would return in The Time Meddler, another historical. Here she's playing her. Here, her, I don't know. And it just saw Eileen Way, who would uh, who would come back in The Creature from the Pit. And here she's playing the old mother. In The Creature from the Pit, she plays Corella. It's quite a brave move, actually. Making the jump from this very kind of ahead of its, ahead of its time episode, largely in the present day, to jumping way back to the dawn of time with... Well, it's essentially just cavemen, cavemen trying to make fire and shouting a lot. God, he's he's not happy about not being able to make fire. Um, it's it's quite, yeah. I'm I'm not sure what modern day audiences would make of it, to be honest, because it is quite. I suppose some might find it quite. Why is cow maybe cow? Why is he just staring at him at the police box? He's just standing there, and just still so. Oh. Uh, but then it's not every day that your average caveman actually gets to see a police box appear, appear out of nowhere. So the TARDIS crew have just recovered. And of course Ian and Barbara at this point can't even comprehend that they've actually travelled way back in time. Now that should be a history lesson for them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic that, you know, the, you know, the teachers... Uh, you know, a teacher of history, that they actually get to experience it firsthand. And it's not quite like the history books say it is. We're going to see some, uh, a lot more anti-heroics than the Doctor in this episode. That's, that's not a bad design, actually. Um, it, it looks, yeah, it, it doesn't look too bad at all. You know, obviously, today you'd be able to go to town with uh, with the designs, but here it's you know I, I think it's very well realised, and of course that Tardy set looks amazing. Oh no, he just did the Doctor Who gag. Yeah, 
Unfortunately, all the time, you know, especially in Stephen Moffat's time, it's just constant Doctor Who. Um, I mean, talk about overuse of a bad joke. I think I think they only referred to it in in this story, but uh, you know, and of course, Doctor Who and the Silurians. But um, yeah, I mean, it it just gets way overused when it comes to Moffat. He's such a <laughs> curmudgeonly okay. He actually makes Victor Mildew look like a clown. Uh, he's, he's just, yeah. And the, the way that Hartnell kind of revels in it as well, he re, he revels in this, you know, lording it over um, Barbara and Ian. It is impossible to think that Hartnell was only 55 when he recorded this. I mean, he's what... Um, Six years older than me, give or take. I mean, it's it's incredible. But then you know, uh, it's 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 a completely different time. And I suppose you know, back in those days, fifty five was considered quite old. Here we go, brave new world. Yeah, they're you know they're complete they're completely amazed by it i mean it's uh such, such a weird thing oh what the doctor's got like one of those old leather s school satchels i think he's got his pipe and backy in it i think i don't know that's a nice touch there the way that ian is you know sort of dizzy and uh you know he, he almost literally stumbles out of uh of a TARDIS at this point. Okay, who closed the doors? Has the Doctor got like one of those um, car locks where you just um, lock it with a click of the switch? Which um, I think the Doctor does that in the end of time. I think I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a it's a great reaction, and uh, but Hartnell Hartnell's Doctor, of course, is. You know, he he's he's just not happy because um he's not in the place that he thought he would be. And Atardis is still stuck in the in the uh, the form of a police box because the chameleon circuit is jammed. It's great the way Doctor Who kind of breaks all the conventions of traditional sci-fi. You don't get like this big swanky spaceship you just get this rickety old police box i mean it's a uh, it's genius and hartnell's brains are about to be bashed in oh dear i mean it looks authentic i mean when it went you know when i saw it for the first time i mean i was i was amazed by it i don't really think doctor who is kind of when they made it all those years ago i don't think that they were expecting uh geeks like me to you know, sit down and drone on about it. Um, it. It was made simply for instant consumption. You know, it would be um, made for, you know, TV viewing one week and then forgotten about the next. I mean, it was shown in low definition. And then that's what that's why a lot of the episodes were later junked, unfortunately. Oh, I'm looking forward to those recons. Yeah, they're going to be a treat. So I first reviewed this many moons ago for... A website called Shadow Locked. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if you remember that. Um, it was. It was basically a sci-fi and cult TV website. Um, previous to that, I'd actually done some reviews for Blake Seven for a website called Den of Geek. Oh god, Ian's just made the Doctor Who joke again. And I kind of set myself a target of trying to review every Doctor Who story in order. And I, I, I didn't think I would have done it. I mean, it was tough enough doing the, the Blake 7 stuff, but I just didn't think I would be able to do uh, the Doctor Who reviews. Oh, yeah, smoking is bad for you kids, remember. That's the only time the Doctor smokes, isn't it, I think. Yeah, very unusual. So you've got an anti-hero Doctor... And uh, and you've got a smoking doctor as well. So I suspect both of those will not be allowed these days. I don't know. But yeah, anyway, Shadow Lot. Um, I started reviewing these. I think it was 
late 2009, early 2010, I think. And back then, a lot of it wasn't wasn't as easily available. I think um, I think I was fortunate in that an unearthly child had come out on DVD. But um, you know, trying to track down the recons and stuff that was that was a lot more difficult. And I think in the early days, I was thinking, oh my god, I'm never gonna um, make it through the whole series. But um, but I did manage. Well, technically, I managed to make it through the original, the classic one of Doctor Who. Um, but I think I came unstuck when it came to the um, uh, the later years of Doctor Who. You know, sort of. Uh, I think halfway through Capaldi's run, I think. Uh, I think I ran out of steam there, um, mainly because um, at this point I'd be, I'd be, you know, become a dad for the first time, and there there just was not time to actually sit down and watch the episodes or you know or write them. So uh, this should be quite an interesting experiment. I'm not sure whether I'll make it, you know, that far. To be honest, um, who knows. Yeah, please excuse the shaky camera work. I am sorry about that. So here we've got um, Zar, and I want to say he's called Horg. He's played by a guy called Howard Lang. And there's this kind of weird power shift um, between Zar and Cal over who gets to be the leader of a tribe. Now, Zar, I think it's Zar, he's so obsessed with... Uh, making fire, but he's kind of lost sight of um, all his regular leader duties, like going out and hunting, bringing the food back. We're not talking about, you know, going down the shops to pick up a whole load of groceries. We're actually talking about going hunting for food. Ugh. But he's neglecting all that and, you know, doing all the traditional things that um, that a prospective leader would do. And not just a prospective leader, also... Uh, a prospective husband for her as well. And, of course, Hawk thinks that Cal should be the leader and also the prospective husband of her. So there, there's this, you know, kind of power dynamic going on. There's all these internal politics going on. Um, and it's kind of like Cal sort of, uh, he, he muscled in. He came from a tribe... Um, which had been which had been wiped out, so he kind of tries to muscle in on on this one and tries to tries to become you know usurp um, Czar as the leader. And of course, they they just communicating grunts. Of course, <laughs> so, I, I, I wonder what the actors you know kind of um, thought when the uh, the script clatter through their letterboxes whether they you know whether they actually knew that they were going to be looking at um lines like uh oh run away oh make fire pretty easy i mean it's you know it's pretty easy dialogue to learn and i also wonder how many actors actually knew that they that they would be remembered so long after this you know i mean did they get the, well, they must have. They must have got regular fan mail. It's amazing how Doctor Who, how quickly Doctor Who developed into this kind of cult, I suppose. Um, but back then, they were they were just making what they thought was disposable TV. It was going to be, you know, hopefully seen by a fair few million viewers, and then, you know, forgotten about it. It became ephemera, if you like. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really quite sure if um, kids would have been entertained by this so much. Um, I've, I've got to admit, I, I never liked history. hated history. Oh. I made the mistake of doing history A-levels and it just completely put me off. Colliers! Yeah, no, didn't like Colliers very much. Colliers College. Yeah, I mean, when when it comes down to the uh, you know the aesthetics of the of the episode, I mean, it's all bad wigs and uh, skins, and I've, I'm sure I read somewhere that um, some poor extra had to put up with a whole load of fleas in in one of the uh, in one of the skins that they had to wear. So, 
yeah, probably not a very comfortable shoot, especially not under, you know, the hot studio lights as well. And really, the, if, if I'm being brutally honest, there's probably not as much room for Waris Hussein to actually come up with any interesting directorial touches or, um, you know, there, there's a few crossfades here and there, but it's probably, you know, not not quite as uh, visually arresting, I suppose, as, as episode one. So, of course, they released this on video in... Uh, 1990, I think it was January 1990, and that was the year when they really started to release all the black and white stuff on uh, on videotape. Um, and I think they released, uh, was it 2006? They released it on DVD, um, and it was it was quite odd because they only did a commentary for a couple of the episodes. They they didn't um, they didn't do. Um, you know, all four episodes with commentary, which um, I, I think was down to budgetary issues rather than, um, you know, a deliberate move. What the, I'm, sh I'm sure they'll re-release it with, um, with intact commentary for the Blu-rays when that surfaces. And I, d I don't know what format that's going to take, you know, with Marco Polo being missing. Uh, are, they, have, are there any missing episodes out there? I have no idea. I, I would like to think so, but uh, no. I, th I think it's just sadly a pipe dream. <laughs> so Hartman's just woken up. Had a nice little power nap there. And of course, this was in the days before um, the regular cast would actually take holidays, which, uh, well, I was going to say you wouldn't hear of these days, but... Of course, you know, you, you do get what they call Dr. Light episodes, which allows, you know, the leading actor or actress to um, have a have a week off and uh, go on holiday or sit in the garden with a, with a glass of fizzy pop and a straw. But yeah, I mean, back then, you know, Hartnell uh, would, would just take away, and, and Troughton, of course, would also take the odd week off. Because the turnaround of episodes was was ridiculous back then. You would actually make it um, practically um, a, about a few days, or maybe even a you know maybe if you were lucky a week before recording. So it was it was a real treadmill, and it, it was amazing how much you know they must have had a hell of a lot of stamina to put in all that work. You know you would rehearse it. Um, for a few days leading up to the actual recording, and then you would kind of record it as um, as in real time, as if it was a stage play. So that must have taken a you know hell of a hell of a lot of stamina, hell of a lot of determination as well. So it it was actually amazing that they recorded it in such fashion. Um, it would be unheard of in these days, whereas you know these days it's just you know instant rehearse record. You know you rehearse a scene and then you record it next. I think, anyway. I don't know. Just a quick shout out as well for the uh, for the sound effects. It doesn't have um, wall to wall music, but it does have a really effective soundscape. I think it sounds so eerie. You know that kind of constant desolate howl. And to me, that that eerie background noise it really adds to the the desolation of the episode and this kind of really bleak atmosphere. The the four travellers are actually in danger for their lives. They could, um, you know, they could well be just bumped off at any any moment now. And as we'll see in the next episode, it, um, travelling with a doctor isn't quite the uh, um, the trip of a lifetime that the modern series um, professes to be, because people will start lo losing their lives and not come back to life with a sprinkle of fairy dust either. Because hey, everybody lives, right, kids? Yeah, it's hard to believe that Derek Newark actually <laughs> would go on to become, you know, the sexiest bore of uh, uh, B double O R, not B O R E, of uh, of Inferno. I suppose, I suppose, you know, Greg Sutton hasn't really come a long way from uh, from the character of uh, of Czar, I guess. I mean, presumably he chatted up uh, her in the same fashion as Greg Sutton did with uh, with Petra. 
Yeah, Eileen Way is, is really good as the, the kind of the ominous old lady of the tribe. Is it old lady, old woman? I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, but if, if I'm being honest, I think I prefer her turn in uh, The Creature from the Pit as Corella because she's, uh, it's, it's quite a funny performance as well. You know, she's just really greedy and, uh, and, just, and just doesn't give a damn that, you know, uh, her fellow in occupants of the planet are just going to lose out because of a load of uh, a load of tin or the equipment and a load of money. So here we are in the cave of skulls. Does exactly what it says in the tin. Again, there's something really quite macabre about it. You know, all these skulls and um, we're coming up to the cliffhanger actually, where the um, you know they say that the skulls are being split open. So again, it's. It's not an obvious cliffhanger, but it's kind of, you know, it's, it, it is quite brutal because of the implication of what could happen if the tribe of gum actually just get bored with the travellers and decide to get rid of them. You know, their skulls are going to be bashed in as well and uh, added to the collection of, uh, of skulls like there. Yeah, something quite, quite scary about skeletons, I think. Of course, this was the days before certain characters would be bumped off and, uh, and turned into skeletons like Kerensky and uh, the Three Who Rule and all of those. Penny and Blake Seven as well. So that was the end of The Cave of Skulls. Um, oh, she was called Old Mother, by the way. Uh, I hope, I hope uh, for the, uh, the two faithful viewers that are tuning in, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, there'll probably be one viewer after this video. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, thank you for joining me and I hope to see you on the next episode, which is The Forest of Fear. But until then, it's bye from me, John. Goodbye for now.